Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our park seminar this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Noel Madir from the Technion in Israel as our speaker this morning. Noam is a park affiliate, research affiliate, and uh, is a very active uh, collaborator with my group and I think with some of the other uh, groups in PARC. Uh, Noam got his bachelor's and PhD degree from uh, Hebrew University. He did his PhD with Itzhak Ohad. And then he went to UC San Diego, where he was a postdoc with George Bayer. And it was there, I think, that he learned X-ray crystallography and has continued with that as his uh, principal uh, experimental technique uh, since he established his own laboratory at the Technion. He's now uh, an expert on, uh, in particular, the Ficobilly zone, which is what he's going to tell us about today. And uh, has really done, I think, more than just about anybody to uh, understand the sort of higher order structure of the Ficobilly zone, which is an incredibly complex antenna complex, hence it's quite appropriate for a park. So, no, welcome. We're pleased to have you with us today. Introduction. Thank you all for coming and for inviting me to this great place. Uh, I think it's the first place where antennas have been put in their proper position, which is on top, <laughs> running, running everything. Uh, and, and, this is, and this is a great opportunity uh, for me. Uh, as you can see from my first slide and from the title, I will be talking a little bit about architecture. And some of this become, is started because I come from a technical university, which has an architect school, and I became interested in architecture. And as you'll see, because I'm talking about a complex which is really immense, it really has an architecture that becomes very interesting to understand. Uh, it looks like a dome above photosystem too, which is why I always start with dome structures. This is the Baha'i Temple, the Haifa, where the Technion is situated, is the world center of the Baha'i religion. And this was just recently <coughs> replated with new gold, so it's very nice, and I'm quite sure all. And of course, I looked for every city where I could give a talk, and St. Louis also has a dome structure, luckily. Um, so it's the old, old something or other, old, old, old courthouse, right, the old courthouse. So, and why domes? Domes are, of course, a very important structure because they impart many things to the structure that they're protecting, uh, but mostly they're, they're very grand. When one looks at a, at a structure of a dome, you, you see strength and you see purpose. And usually it's very, uh, one, some of the most beautiful uh, buildings in the world have domes on them. And I think that the Ficobilla Zone is a proper dome for photosystem too. So just a, a few words about uh, where I come from and, and the, what we're interested in the lab. This is the port city of Haifa. Um, and we're actually not situated in this part. We're situated kind of along the Carmel Mountain. For those of you that know this, Carmel's in California, but the real Carmel is in Israel. And this is the Baha'i Temple. And this is the Technion campus uh, on Mount Carmel. And this is our apartment. This is our new Center for Life Sciences and Engineering, which is where our new structural biology department is going to go into with new facilities. And this is the Rappaport School of Medicine down uh, near the port, where our two first two Nobel Prize winners worked. This is, of course, uh, uh, Hershko and Chihanover. And very happy to say that we now have our third Nobel Prize winner, which is Danny Schechtman, who's up here in this campus. Uh, for his discovery of quasi-crystals, so I think that, that we're all excited about this happening. Um, the lab is interested in many aspects of uh, uh, the biochemistry of uh, organisms, mostly microorganisms, but not, not only. We're a lot interested in many different enzyme structures, a lot about metal ion uh, transport, um, photosynthetic light harvesting, uh, assembly, and this assembly of protein complexes, and I'll discuss this today, and a couple of other things. And we're also a lot interested in, in other aspects of photosynthesis, including trying to use photosystem two to create a totally green uh, energy producing system using photosynthesis directly. Um, and these are kind of, kind of uh, the rogue gallery of some of the structures that we've uh, solved over the time. I show this because maybe there'll be people interested in other things uh, besides microbilisomes. We work on, on heat stress uh, type proteins, uh, as I uh, said, enzymes and, and metal transport uh, uh, proteins, etc. And we have a lot of things along the way that uh, some of them I'll discuss today. Okay, so that's kind of that's the introduction. And uh, I mentioned architecture. <clears throat> so when I take a look at a building like this, this temple from China, 
And as biochemists that look at complexes many times, we're looking at what the structure looks at and trying to guess, well, what does this do? Not only what is the active site, because the active site is something that we make measurements on, but the active site is not the whole story. In fact, the active site won't do what it does unless it has all of the rest of the biochemical facets around it. And many times, we have to guess about that. We have to guess, well, what is that amino acid doing there, or what is that loop for? And when we look at this building, at least for me, what it says is, the architect said, that's it. This is the end of this building. You're not going to do anything else. It's perfect just as, as it is. Obviously, there's not very much chance of putting anything onto this building unless you actually take off the roof. Um, and that's kind of what this looks like. This is a, a, a light harvesting complex, which looks as if this is the end store. It's circular. All the chlorophylls are arranged very nicely. Um, it's the end. You can add more of them, but this building that holds the light harvesting uh, components is finished. Now, of course, roofs do a lot of things. They protect from the sun, but of course, one of the most important things is it takes the water away and doesn't let the water get into the building. And when you look at this building, I can't tell where the water goes. So the architect hid whatever it's doing with the water away from us. So we have to try to discover how this building takes the water away in order to discover how it functions. Now, this is the old Technion building. It was built actually before 1914. It was the first university in, in Palestine of then. The Turks were still in Palestine. And this is a kind of an oriental type of modern Western building because theoretically, there's no problem to build, at least as, as long as the architects or the, the constructors made good enough uh, foundations, there's no problem to put another floor onto this building. So this is more like this uh, light harvesting antenna, the phycobilazone, which basically is a very modular structure which theoretically can grow forever. And in fact, in certain mutations, these rod structures, which I'll talk a lot about, can grow forever. In fact, they're stopped because of certain functional facets which we have to discover. Another thing is that uh, you can see here what looks like to be the way to get the water out of the building. These are the, the um, call them in English, whatever that takes the, the water out, downspouts. the downspouts. These are the downspouts, and hopefully they take the water out. So here, we already see something that we can say, OK, let we, if we make a mutation here, then, then we should see the water coming over the wall, and we know that this is actually what it was. So we can learn from the architecture just by looking at it. <clears throat> These are three buildings in Tel Aviv, and an electron microscope, if you see it, right, microscope, microscope, if you looked at this, would say it's three different things. It looks like three different things, although there is, of course, a similarity to them. And light harvesting, of course, comes in different shapes and flavors. There's a lot of similarity to them, and we can pick out the similarities, but we have to know that they're also different. One of them is an office building, one has a hotel, and then one has a shopping center. You can't know that unless you go into the details. So what we want to look at is at the overall structure, trying to understand how the entire complex performs what it has to perform, but also get into the details. So here we have a couple, a couple of structures of light harvesting complexes that have been determined over the years. And of course, in this audience, I don't have to uh, say too much about them. I'm sure that you uh, know about them <coughs> very much. This is the chlorosome, which is, of course, also uh, researched here at St. Louis. Very, very different than the other ones. A completely different architecture and completely different in how it packs the powerhouse of light harvesting, the chlorophylls. Um, and I won't discuss this any further, but this is what I'm going to talk about, and this is the phycobilisome, the main light harvesting complex in cyanobacteria and red algae. And this is, of course, just a model. It's a model that we made out of pieces that we have determined the structures, but we actually don't, don't know that it looks like this. So what we want to do is get the blueprints for how to build a light harvesting complex which will be useful, it will be efficient, and if we're talking about the future, was also something that would be very easy to use. And phycobilazone is an excellent example because it's water soluble. You don't have to extract it with uh, detergents. It sits on the membrane. It self-assembles. And as I'll show, it has also uh, the ability to self-disassemble. But of course, we have to have all the nitty-gritty details to understand how this works. The phycobilazone was discovered back in the early 60s, maybe in the 50s. I think it was seen even before that, but really wasn't understood what it was. And these are all these very large granules that you can see here lined along the thylakoid membrane in this, in this sand bacterium. 
Uh, one thing that might be apparent to some of you is that there looks like there's too many of them. Because in cyanobacteria, there's not that much photosystem 2. There's actually only 1 to 6 or 1 to 9 compared to photosystem 1. And it looks like the phycopilosome actually completely lines the, the cytochrome membranes. So why are there so many phycopilosomes? This is something that we have to address. But it looks that they're rather even. That is, they're rather homogeneous in size. This is a good candidate for crystallization. You want to start with something which is apparently the same in order to crystallize it. Although it's, of course, quite large, as I'll show you. And when you break open the cells in the proper conditions, you get something that looks like this. This uh, was published in 1989 in a review by Alex Laser. And this is, since it was in the paper, obviously this is about the best you could get. And I think that if you look at it, you'll see this is pretty lousy. I mean, already it looks uneven on the sides. There's something that's fallen off here. There's another piece over here, another piece over here. Here's there's another disc. And this is, this is in the review, so this is about as good as you can, can get. But this has spawned basically the model which you'll find in any textbook, if there is a textbook that has a picture of a phycopilosome, which is this, made up of a core of disks of a certain dimension. All disks that I'm going to mention have the same dimensions, uh, which contains the protein called alpha-cyanin. And then attached onto it in a kind of a radial type of fashion, rods. Now, there are also phycopilosomes with only two core cylinders. There are those that have five core cylinders. There are those that have uh, more than six uh, rods attached to it. Uh, but, but many, many, many of the cyanobacterium and the red algae have this tri-cylindrical uh, uh, core with six rods attached to it. The rods always contain phycocyanin adjacent to the alpha-phycocyanin in the core. In some of them, there's another pigment called phycoerythrin or phycocyanoerythrin, which absorbs further to the blue. And what's very nice is, and as I'll show you, is that we can funnel the energy very efficiently in the area which the chlorophylls don't. Absorb. Now, the size is huge. It actually can be much bigger than this. This is the size of the head of the F1 ATP synthase. This is the size of a 70S ribosome. So, of course, understanding what the entire structure of a complex like this is, of course, daunting. But since uh, we already know that the, that the ribosome can be crystallized, so then nothing perhaps cannot be crystallized, so why not try and do it? Now, the big problem is that this is actually what we're, we're looking at. We're not looking at the building that I showed you in the previous slide. This is a uh, low resolution EM of that, that uh, temple in, in China. So we're really looking at pictures which we don't have the fine details in yet. We have pieces of it at very high resolution, as I'll show you. And what we'd like to do, of course, is to use the two methods to try to fit this together and either get a high resolution structure from the whole complex or mesh it together to get a high resolution structure of the entire complex using these bits and pieces. It's not easy to find this perhaps fits here, maybe, but maybe it fits over here. This, I can tell you I took out of here, but it's not really apparent that it goes there. And if there wasn't the colors, and of course in EM we don't see the colors, we wouldn't know that this is the door that fits over here. So this is, this is a complicated uh, procedure. As I mentioned, uh, phycobilosome is a very efficient energy funnel. Uh, this is the absorption chlorophylls. You can see we have this area here which doesn't do anything. And there's a lot of photons in that area, so cyanobacteria and algae have, have utilized this very efficiently. Plants seem to get by without it um, for, for different reasons. Phycoerythrin further to the blue, and then phycocyanin, energy funneling into alpha-phycocyanin, and from the terminal emitter in alpha-phycocyanin right straight into the reaction centers. <clears throat> I'll be discussing mostly in this lecture the phycobilosomes from a uh, thermophilic cyanobacterium called uh, Thermocinococcus volcanus, which does not have phycoerythrin, so it's a little bit simpler. Um, and it has two components, phycocyanin and alpha-phycocyanin. And if you take just one simple unit of phycocyanin, what we call the trimer, which I'll uh, exemplify soon, which looks like this, it has an absorption at 620 nanometers. If we take that of alpha-phycocyanin, it has an absorption at 652 nanometers with this shoulder at 652. However, the cofactor is exactly the same. The positions are exactly the same. It's not really quite clear why there's this redshift of more than 30 nanometers in their absorption spectra. And even more than that, if we take this ring apart into the basic units, what we call the monomers, it doesn't matter if it's phycocyanin or alpha-phycocyanin, the absorption is at 620 nanometers. 
So something is happening here, and this is very indicative of what ha has to happen in the phycobilisome for energy to flow in the right direction. Now, what is the cofactor? The cofactor which is doing all the absorption are linear tetraperols, and the linear tetraperols, as we see here, um, are basically a heme that's been synthetically opened within the organism, it loses, of course, the magnesium. Um, now, uh, a molecule like that tries to close in on itself, and if it closes in on itself, it basically loses its absorption. So what keeps it taut and open in a form like we see here, carved out of the crystal structure, is, of course, the protein. So unlike the chlorophylls, which basically are chlorophyll whether you put them in or out of a protein, of course, they absorb differently, but it's still chlorophyll, the bilin of bile pigments, they immediately lose their absorption if they're not bound to a protein because they try to close in on themselves. So what is special about the um, uh, bilin is, of course, its structure, which is held open by the protein, but not only that. Another facet, which is important, is that it's covalently bound by a thioether bond to, cyst to conserve cysteines within the protein. And so the proteins continue to be colored no matter what you do to them. And this is, of course, very important for this facet of holding it open. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, not only that, a big difference is, of course, the proteins surrounding it. And this is what interests us as crystallographers, is trying to understand what it is about these pockets that hold the cofactors in them that create the differences between the different proteins. And of course, one of the big issues is, is of course, the chemical bonds between the cofactor and the protein, what kind of charges we have, what kind of hydrogen bonding we have, whether or not electrostatic potentials of the surfaces have any effect on the uh, uh, cofactor, and what, how this changes as the assembly of the phycobilisome gets larger and larger. And of course, the next step is trying to understand how these things really create phycobilisome by assembly. And here we see, as I uh, told you before, the monomeric unit. We call it a monomer. Actually, it's a heterodimer of two proteins, alpha and beta. And the, uh, this is phycocyanin. So the beta subunit has two cofactors. The alpha subunit has one cofactor. In alpha phycocyanin, it doesn't have this outside cofactor, just the two of them. But other than that, I could put up alpha phycocyanin and it would look very, very similar. So how is energy transferred <coughs> amongst these cofactors? One big difference compared to the other uh, antennas is that the cofactors, as you saw in the previous slide, are very far apart. We're talking about um, uh, 30, 40, 50 angstroms, one from the other, something that is much more uh, uh, amenable to what we would explain as being Foyer, uh, sorry, Forster resonance energy transfer, or FRET. Uh, and as crystallographers, what we're hoping to give the uh, a biophysicist is basically the ability, by using our coordinates, to fill in all of these coordinates, all these different parameters at the highest level of detail in order to understand energy transfer pathways. But obviously, when this becomes starts becoming aggregated, some of the cofactors close in one another. They don't actually come too close. None of the cofactors are really close within about 20 angstroms from one another, and yet we start seeing coupled excitons being formed. And this is apparently what happens in alpha phycocyanin. And, and again, here, if we can understand that on the level of the uh, electric and the nuclear structure, this will, of course, uh, explain <coughs> how the uh, performs what it performs. So <clears throat> these are some of the structures that we've determined. Uh, and these are the people, of course, that did the work. Uh, Liron and uh, Amirav and Ailey and Monica did uh, most of the work here. Actually, Forrest worked on, on this pro uh, protein, which I won't talk about today. Um, and as you can see, all the crystals are very nice and blue, which is very helpful when you're a crystallographer because it's easy to find them and, and to pick them up. Not all of them are very uh, easy to work with, but phycocyanin, which is these crystals, are it's very easy to work with. In fact, it'll, it'll crystallize as a 5% uh, contamination in a mixture of other proteins, which shows, again, its ability for self-assembly. This is very unique about this protein. It doesn't happen with other proteins. And these are some of the structures. Some of the structures have been deposited. Some of them are still waiting for us to finish the papers to deposit them. And what I'll discuss also today are crystals of higher level uh, assemblies of uh, phycobilisome and the NBLA protein, which is, is a molecular disassemblase, um, uh, which we have also determined the structure. So let's start from the details at the uh, highest level. We're talking again about this difference in the uh, uh, energy absorption spectra of alpha-phycocyanin versus phycocyanin. This is all from t as I mentioned. This is the alpha subunit with the one cofactor, 
in L factor sine and factor sine. And it looks pretty much the same. And it indeed is pretty much the same. And as I mentioned, if we take just the alpha subunit with its cofactor, basically both of them will absorb at uh, 620 nanometers. It's only if we do something to start the assembly process going where L phycosinin changes and phycosinin doesn't. So I, I, APC trimer is redshifted. So we have to talk a little bit about assembly. What happens during assembly? We have the two subunits, the alpha and the beta, that come together to form the monomer, and very quickly we form the trimer, which has, in the case of phycosinin, nine cofactors, in the case of alpha phycosinin, six. Now, this happens within the cell, of course, and it happens very quickly. And most of what people have been isolating forever are trimers. Because if you open up a cyanobacterium or a red algae and pour out the contents, which contains a lot of phycobilisomes, uh, um, they immediately disintegrate. They immediately disintegrate, and the most stable structure is the trimer. It's actually, you have to work hard to get a monomer. You have to actually add chemicals to, to make it happen. So this is a very stable structure. But the rest of what happens later falls apart very quickly. The only way to preserve the next steps is if you actually isolate them in high phosphate buffer or high citrate buffer. Uh, when I say high, I'm talking about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 molar, which is very high and not very conducive for many type of the type of things that you'd like to do. But unfortunately, this is the only way to preserve the phycobilisome structure. Now, the trimer very quickly, in the case of phycocyanin and phycoerythrin, assembles into this alpha beta 6 hexamer, so basically it just comes together like that face to face. And now we start to see one other protein that I haven't mentioned until now, which is called a linker protein. The linker protein fits inside the hole and theoretically links between the subunits. In fact, there are quite a few of these linkers, and it, each linker has its own role. Um, in fact, it's needed in order to get the next step up, which is, for instance, getting a rod or a core. Now, one would think that these linkers, if they're there, would stabilize the structure. So why this is the thing falling apart? This is a question that I'm going to try to answer. So I'm going back now to alpha-phycosinin versus phycosinin. What is the difference between them? Now, we were not the first ones to solve the structure. Actually, the first structure came out in, I think, 1999 uh, by the Hoover Group. And there was uh, about two more structures um, that also solved alpha-phycosinin. And yet, nobody seemed to try to find what is the structural basis for the redshift. And this was actually quite surprising for us when we started uh, trying to crystallize it. Now, it was more difficult than phycosinin was because uh, alpha cosine is heterogeneous within the, in, within the core. There are some sub-fractions, uh, sub-populations. Uh, Didn't matter, we managed to solve the structure. And what we found was, looking specifically for this structural facet, is that if we compare now phycocyanin to alpha cosine in the trimeric assembly, in the case of phycocyanin, the pocket that covers the cofactor is rather shallow and rather uh, a polar, and actually you can see some water molecules slipping in here. In the case of alpha-phycosinin, there are a bunch of aromatic residues here that actually close in on the cofactor and make a hydrophobic tight pocket on this cofactor. And this now is very close to the second cofactor, which comes in within 20 angstroms. There's another cofactor in phycosinin as well, same structure. However, this is polar, and this is hydrophobic, this is tight, and this is rather loose. So this should be the reason for formation of this, uh, uh, this coupled exothon. Trouble is that if you put a hydrophobic pocket around the cofactor, you should have a little blue shift, not a red shift. So what's happening here? Why are we getting a red shift? What we believe is happening, actually, is that the hydrophobic pocket is holding the cofactors very tightly together. But the redshift is caused by these very uh, uh, polar uh, mm -hmm. residues, especially glutamic acids, spartic acids, and these lysines here, which surround as a second shell around that pocket. Now, there's some charged residues in phycocyanin, but since it's polar on the inside also, their effect is rather minor. Um, so what we think is that, that we have to have this charge surrounding the hydrophobic pocket in order to get this very unique 20 angstrom away uh, a coupled pair. Um, and this is just says what I just said in, in, in words. Um, so we took the alpha sign and it said, okay, let's separate it into monomers. And we started working on it. And we were able to make enough of a denaturation, uh, either uh, thermally or with urea, to see a loss of the 652 band. And yet, when we ran a native gel, you can see that we still see trimers here. 
The trimers, if here in urea, for instance, without urea and with urea, stay a trimer in Vulcanos, and synecosis, by the way, falls apart very quickly, but we'll talk about the Vulcanos, um, it's still a trimer, and yet, and yet we've lost the 652 band. So it's not monomerization that, that induces this shift, it's just a loosening up of that pocket. All you have to do is get some solvent in there, and you immediately lose the coupling between the two uh, uh, cofactors. Now, recently, I started working with uh, Bob on the uh, Carnotaurus Marina, and uh, my student, uh, Ailey, came to me one day, and she said, well, look, if you look at the sequence of alpha-phytocytin, there's a gap here in the uh, sequence alignment. So we're looking at the area which is important for forming that hydrophobic pocket with the charged residues around it. We can see there's this GEEM, which is rather uh, conserved in all the organisms. It's missing here in, in the marina. Now, of course, it's not really missing. I mean, there's not a gap in the protein. So all it means is that this tyrosine is, is hooked up to this serine, and it's pulling it towards it, but it's missing those charged residues, and something has happened. Now, we don't have structure yet. This is something that we have to work on, but we, of course, can, we can build a model rather easily. Now, if we build a model, since we're missing those residues, something has, something has to give. We're pulling that, 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 those, those residues a little bit further out. We can't move the cysteine because the cofactor has to be in the same position. And what you can see here is this gap. Now, I don't believe that this gap is an actual gap. I don't think there's an actual gap there. What it means, though, is that it's looser than it is in the Vulcanus or in any other set of bacterium in the um, uh, A. marina. And if we do the superposition, we see that there's a, a shift of a loop that moves away from it, and this is why it looks like it's open. And interestingly, oh, sorry, I should say it here. Alpha-cytosine from uh, A. marina doesn't have a redshift to 652 nanometers. It's actually redshifted only to about 640 nanometers. That's a much less pronounced redshift. And I think that this is, again, proof that this is the reason for the redshift in alpha But now, of course, we have to get enough alpha to try to crystallize uh, that structure. OK. So now I'm going to go on uh, towards higher uh, uh, assemblies. Um, as biochemists, uh, biochemistry uses uh, the same rules for almost all protein complexes, with the details, of course, difference. Most complexes are either of the type of a homo-oligomerization, which means you take the protein, same protein subunit, and it forms a closed type of structure. Those light harvesting uh, complexes I showed before are those type of rings formed basically from the same units that form a closed ring. In this case, it's an enzyme that we, that we determine the structure of, and it uh, has these, these locks which hold onto it, and again, this is a closed structure. Or you have a hetero oligomerized uh, complex, like a ribosome, where you have a lot of RNA, and each protein has its own nook and cranny. No one protein will find itself in, a, in the wrong hole because it doesn't fit. So you're really determining the structure from uh, the sequence on, on, the, on the beginning. The phycobilisome is a little bit different. It's somewhere in the middle. It's kind of um, a uh, quasi-homo uh, 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 oligomerization because all the subunits look the same. They all have the same dimension. They're very similar as far as sequence goes. Uh, and yet, there are no, there are no mistakes. You never get an alpha-alpha monomer. You never get an alpha-phycosine and phycosine mismatch within trimers. Even if you express them by themselves, very hard to get um, uh, a, a uh, homo oligomer of alphas or betas. So what's happening here? So we try to look and see what are the details which allow this complex to assemble itself. And this is just one example. And we're looking here at alpha-phycosine. And here we have the alpha subunit. Here's the beta subunit. And the, uh, the alpha subunit has its internal residue cleaved by an enzyme which takes off the first methionine. This happens in other places. This is a special enzyme. And what is it good for? What it's good for is that instead of this positively charged N terminal being here where it should be, where it is, let's say, in phycocyanin, it's actually right here in the middle of the protein. And if we look at now at the beta subunit, and this forms the monomer by this this rectangle going 100 degrees onto, onto this rectangle, so it's like this, this negatively charged aspartic acid hits this positively charged uh, resin. Now, all the rest of them, if you look at phycocyanin or other, other ones, they all have a different way of, of, of arranging their electrostatic potential so that this will not actually fit any of the other ones. Um, and on the other hand, the phycocyanins attach to phycocyanins. And then once those two, two charges meet, 
We also have now these charges. This glutamic acid meets this lysine. This glutamic acid meets this lysine. And the, the separation here is very important because the, those, those odd different allophycocyanins like APCD and APCF and APCE, uh, they don't have the same type of arrangement. And so they have to be added on in a different fashion. So this allows only alpha-cosine and alpha-beta to assemble itself into the monomer, and then this can be continued to understand how these things assemble themselves. What is important, though, is that once they're assembled, they don't come off. They don't really disassemble at this level. And the reason is are these locks. These locks, these hydrophobic uh, uh, aromatic, especially uh, phenylalanines and tyrosines that situate themselves inside. But these are conserved. And these exist in alpha-cosinin and phycosinin. So it has to happen, that is, the assembly has to happen first, and only then do these locks come in and, and form uh, the, next, the next step of the structure. So, so why isn't this enough? We have structures now of phycosinin and alpha-cosinin, very high resolution. Uh, phycosinin, we've gone down to 1.35. This is the highest in the, pro in the protein data bank. We have alpha-cosinins. We've solved them for many organisms. Why not just say, OK, this is what the phycobilism look, looks like, and use this as the model? Well, because it's much more than the sum of its components. And this is one example. Uh, a few years back, it was discovered that in synapocystis, uh, a protein called the origin carotenoid protein uh, can somehow associate with the phycobilism. It's not a very large protein. It has a carotenoid, and it can make a, a modified, modified structure depending on the light. And it associates with the phycobilism. And it completely quenches the fluorescence from the, this, in, this gigantic structure. And this is not really easy to understand. How can a single protein attach somewhere and completely uh, uh, quench the, the fluorescence? Obviously, it's a very important point in the phycobilism. We don't know where that is. So here we see the absorption spectra. You can see there's really no difference between the phycobilism and the phycobilism with the uh, OCP. Uh, here's the fluorescence, and this was done by Diana Kirovsky at the CNRS in Paris that we're collaborating with. And so what we're saying is that in order to understand the phycobilisome, we need higher order uh, assemblies. So we started trying to do that. And the first um, uh, level that we tried to do it, work on is the rod from T. Vulcanus, and this is work that was done by Miron David and uh, Amy Marx in my lab. And we already had a good idea because our trimers of phycocyanin already in the crystal assemble themselves into rods. So we were thinking, OK, now maybe we have a chance to prove whether or not the crystal rods are the same as the rods in solution. We want to know what these interfaces look like between the hexamers, between the trimers, and in the monomers. See if everything looks the same in the, in the rods. But of course, we have to prove that it's a rod. And we, I'll show you in a second. We actually were able to obtain crystals. And the crystals diffract quite nicely to one and a half angstroms. And as you can see, they look exactly the same as the trimeric phycosinin. And we were hoping to see the linker proteins. There are three linker proteins within the crystal, within the, within the rod. We couldn't see any of them. And this is something that's happened already in the past in the case of phycoerythrin. The problem is in the crystal is that we have both three-fold symmetry and two-fold symmetry. And basically, the linkers, which are asymmetric within the crystal, are washed out of the electron density because basically they are, are, are separated into six different orientations. But how could we prove that it's actually there, that it's actually a rod? Maybe it's just another phycocyanin crystal. So first of all, this is the isolated trimers and uh, rods of phycocyanin. When you, the, you have a rod in high phosphate with all the linkers, you have a redshift in its absorption and a redshift in its fluorescence. We took and the crystals and took them to a confocal microscope. And what's nice about the confocal microscope is that you can isolate one micron cube of the crystal and measure the fluorescence from that area. And you can do this all over the different places in the crystal and make sure that the entire crystal has the same characteristics as far as fluorescence. And this is a phycocyanin crystal. This is just this is a rod crystal. And I don't know if you can see there's an X here showing one of the positions that we measured. But the phycocyanin crystal has its fluorescence at 649. And the phycocyanin rod crystal has a redshift, just like we see here. So the entire crystal has the behavior of a rod. We can also, of course, solubilize these rod crystals. And we did mass spec. And we see all of the different components, interestingly, I mentioned the linker proteins. So we have this uh, uh, CPCD, which is the uh, protein which stops the rod from growing. It's kind of at the cap, what's called the capping 
uh, uh, rod uh, linker. It has the regular linker, which is in the hexamers, and it has a rod core linker, which is supposed to be the attachment point to the core. There are three of them in T volcanoes, one, two, and four. This, what we crystallized, is only number four. So obviously what we were able to crystallize is only one fraction of the rods. The other ones apparently fall apart in our preparation because this is the only one that crystallized. We didn't see any one or two. Now we were able to show by B-factor analysis and by looking at specific uh, amino acids which change their position that uh, the positions of these uh, linkers actually make sense comparing them to the only single structure within a phycobilin of a small linker in allophycosidin, the 1B33 structure. Uh, so it looks like we see uh, a, an effect on the phycosidin by the presence of the linker besides the fluorescence, even though we can't see them in the electron density. But here we come to the question again, what are these linkers doing? And I, I think when I first heard about them, I immediately, anybody that has kids here has one of these at home because this is one of the first toys that you buy for a kid because it's really easy, it's big, and they can you know, fit it on. And this is what a linker should do. It should link these, these rings and it shouldn't fall apart. Why have a linker protein if it's just gonna fall apart on you when you, when, you, when you break it open? So what's happening here? We didn't have any information. We tried, I can say my students tried valiantly to express these proteins. They're very hydrophobic. They, they go out a solution. We just couldn't do anything with it. Recently, some of the structural genomic centers here in the United States have started solving some of the domains within the linkers. We're not quite sure how they do it because there's no publication. What has happens in these structural genomics places, they crystallize and solve things, and you never really know what they've done. And I don't know if they know what they've done, but we have the structures. So what we were able to do is build a model of the linker protein using two of these structures. These two PFAMs are, are basically two structures which we've modeled together. And this is what maybe one of the linkers looks like. And we, we can see that the homology is quite extensive within the different organisms. And then we looked at the volume of the linker compared to the volume of the empty space within a hexamer. The volume in the channel is the 74,000 angstroms cubed. The volume of our model is, is only about half of that. So there's a lot of empty space. And the linker actually is not a linker like this. It's actually very globular sitting in the center. This is what we believe, of course. We don't have a structure yet. It's sitting here in the middle. It may be it's stabilizing the hexamer. It's certainly not stabilizing the interhexamer interaction. Now, anybody that's looked at a lot of the EM's pictures has never seen a linker sticking out. So I don't even know if the linkers are actually attaching the rods to the cores. Maybe when something happens and they come together, it, it shoots out. Maybe. But it doesn't look like that from the structure. Of course, in biology, things happen. But certainly there's enough room. And what we propose basically is that you can fit actually in one hexamer a capping linker and a full uh, 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 a rod linker in a single hexamer. It fits in quite nicely with room to spare. And what we think is that it should actually be called tuning proteins because we think that this is what they're doing. They're there for a purpose. The reason is to get the energy from downstream, upstream into the core um, efficiently. And that's the reason they're not, they're not really stabilizing the protein. And of course, now we have to continue on and try to get the structures to see if this is correct. And one way of doing that is going to other organisms. And one of the organisms we've gone to is Gloria Bacter. And this is in collaboration with Matthias Rogner and Bernot from Bochum in Germany, uh, who has given us uh, these organisms. And Leron from my lab has been isolating these rods. And we have already crystals of the rods. And you can see they're nice and red because they contain phycoerythrin as well as phycocyanin. And you see that they have two bands of absorption, so they have both the phycoerythrin and the phycocyanin. Uh, this is a single crystal in the confocal microscope. No diffraction yet, but we are hoping that this will get better. We're starting to do some EM work with Anna Artemi, a real expert in, in, in phycobilosome electron microscopy, and here you see it is very long rods. Now, because they seem to have different lengths, this is a problem maybe for the crystallography, so we, we have to improve our, and I'll, I'll mention how we're trying to improve this, as I, as I go along to get good, better crystals. So back to trying to get the entire structure. These are some models that have been published over the years. As you can see, the difference is how the rods come out of the cores. The cores seem to be rather well established, and 
rather well established in the EM as well, but also how the, the, the rods come out. This is, a, this is a big question, and they come out differently. We support the Glazer model because this uh, is, is consistent with our crystal structures. But the best thing would be to get a structure to entire fibrobilism. So, since it's so big, and since it's so sensitive, and you can only isolate it in, in phosphate, the only thing you can do is sucrose gradient or other gradients. There's not really a whole lot. You can't do ion exchange. You can't really do anything with it except for run it through sucrose gradients. But we have to, and we get nice hypervillosomes. And I won't go into all the details, but it has all the components, including the large uh, linker, which is supposed to link it to the membrane. Um, and we can get crystals. Actually, we can get crystals of something that looks like an entire phycobilism. But is it a, really an entire phycobilism? Well, we can, I don't know if you can see it. It's hard to see. It's hard to get these really small crystals. But it has all the components um, in uh, the gel. Uh, it has uh, fluorescence. Of, if we, if we um, uh, solubilize the crystals, but still in high phosphate, we get uh, a fluorescence, which is the fluorescence which we would expect from an entire phycobilism. If we do mass spec of the crystals, we see all of the components, and now we see all of the linker proteins, the G1, the G2, and the G4, so it looks like a complete phycobilism. Well, that's great. We should be able to solve the structure. What's the problem? Crystals are actually defect to three and a half angstroms. So again, I mean, this is great. Why have a problem? We've collected complete data sets. But the space group appears to be H32, which is the same space group as phycocytin. The asymmetric unit is just too small for any of the models that I showed you a minute ago. You just can't fit in symmetry, symmetry wise, anything that would have an, an asymmetric unit, which basically is a single monomer of phycocyanin. Even worse, we can solve the structure with the phycocyanin monomer using molecular replacement. We could also solve it without phycocyanin, and we see it, it seems to be good for both of them. So, what's happening here? It's not consistent with any kind of model. It's almost as if maybe what's formed in our crystals are endless rods of our proteins where most of them is as phycocyanin, because we have a lot more phycocyanin, we have twice as much phycocyanin as alpha-phycocyanin, and somewhere in between them is the alpha-phycocyanin. Now, it could be that that's the, what's happening. It could be an artifact of the crystallization um, it, because of the forces and because it's such a weak complex. But we really don't know how to continue with that. So we thought, okay, let's see what happens in electron microscopy. So we started doing electron microscopy on, this, on these complexes. And here, we again met a problem. This is, this is the crystals, and we can solidize the crystals, or we can do this before we get the same results. We're getting what look like dimers of phycobilosomes, which can happen. You know, they're flat on one side. Maybe they've dimerized. This is nothing, certainly nothing natural, but it could happen in solution. But they're fuzzy. They're fuzzy, and nobody can really explain where this fuzziness is coming from. And we've gone to a different experts. We can try to fit into this phycobilosome according to its dimensions what it might look like. We've also done some crime on it. Everything looks like it could be a phycobilosome, and this is coming from the crystals, so it doesn't match that picture that I showed you before, so we're a little bit uh, at ends there. But as we said, one of our problems is, is this high phosphate. Since we have the high phosphate to preserve the structure, we really can't crystallize in anything but high phosphate, so we're limited in the type of, of trials that we can do to find crystals. So what we started to do is to try to cross-link it. And what we're using is a modified method of the graphics method, where basically we run the complex through a sucrose gradient in uh, increasing concentrations of glutaldehyde. And we get a very nice band here, which is a very gently uh, uh, cross-linked phycobilisome. It seems to have a pretty good uh, uh, room temperature absorption spectra. It, the fluorescence looks pretty good. We see fluorescence coming out where alpha phycocyanin terminal emitters should come out. This is actually uh, cryo from crystals grown from this material. And so it looks again as if we've isolated these dimers. Uh, I wish that we could say that we could see details. If these things weren't fuzzy, then we could maybe actually fit in our high resolution structures and do an image analysis. And, and that, would be, that would be great. But it's still fuzzy. So we've started to work with Anna, as I mentioned before, who's an expert, and using now the cross-link material, this is not from the crystals, this is just from the, from the gradient. I won't go into the mess here, it looks like a mess. This is uh, the, the gliobacter phycobilisomes. Um, we really have to improve our preparation in order to get a really homogeneous cross-link sample. 
But if we, this, we manage this, we should be able to get crystals in different conditions and hopefully be able to solve the structure. And this is also good for other things like spectroscopy where, uh, and, and, and electron microscopy and other methods where the high phosphate has always been very problematic. So we're hoping that we can improve these and really get a good structure to crystallize. Well, we can also go to another organism which is simple. And this is the Acaridiflorus marina, which has the simplest microbilosome. This is a picture that I pulled out of a paper by uh, Min Chen uh, from Feb's letter. We can see here the microbilosome stacked here. This is great for a crystallographer. Uh, this is, by the way, this is the reason I did not believe that she could crystallize the ribosome, because in bears, when they hibernate, the ribosomes actually arrange themselves in crystals like this. And when she said, if that happens, then they can be crystallized. This was back in the 70s. So I said, OK, so this should be easy to crystallize. And this is what it should look like. This is, comes from the EEM. It has basically like and hexamers. The last one has only a trimer and a trimer of alpha-cyanine. This is odd. Why have one phycobilosome where the trimers are collinear and all the rest have <coughs> these angles that we see here? It doesn't make any sense. The proteins are rather um, the same. The linkers are pretty much the same. It's a little bit different here, but not that different. This actually makes a lot more sense. I mean, why not put the rods here, this direction? And if you put the rods in this direction, well, you get a crystal like I talked about, where you have endless rods with phycocyanin, and out of phycocyanin. Now, I'm saying this here. Of course, this is going out being broadcast. I don't know if it's going to shoot me down. Don Brian would like to hear this. But what can I say? It, this makes a lot more sense to me. So we have been trying to crystallize. We're getting protein from Bob's lab. These are our crystals that we've had so far, they're really, really tiny, don't diffract yet, but uh, we think we're on our way. They're very nicely homogeneous they, they, uh, as far as their fluorescence and absorption. We're, of course, going to try to cross-link these as well in order to stabilize them to find conditions not in high phosphate, but this is really a good chance of maybe getting um, uh, a crystal structure of an entire phycobilisome. Unfortunately, and this was measurements made here, I won't go into all the details here about the, how this was done, the fluorescence correlation, correlation spectroscopy, but even in high phosphate, if the protein is dilute, it starts falling apart. So this disassembly problem, uh, it, it will always be a problem unless we can find a good way to stabilize it with cross -linking. But, uh, oh, and we're also trying to do the uh, silicosystis um, uh, entire phycobilism with the OCP. These, I don't think you can see here, but these are crystals in the confocal microscope. This is the crystal of the silicococcus, silicocystis phycobilism without the OCP and with the OCP. And we can see that the fluorescence is quenched. So we think that we have actually the complex here. And we're hoping that maybe we can also solve this structure. We're also trying, we started to do some um, uh, ultra-fast spectroscopy now with the cross link material. This is just to show that it's possible. This is low temperature, and we can see a really nice splitting here. This is done with a German group uh, that was actually initiated by this, this very interesting uh, doctor student, Albert Legano, working with Joachim Eichler. And he's trying to do really fast spectroscopy on entire microbilosomes, very complicated spectra. Won't go into it, but there's this hole here. This is hole burning. And this is the excitation at 650 nanometers. And he sees this decrease in the energy of the absorption here actually blue shifted. He claims that it might be an interaction between peripheral co-units, which again would point us to having the rods parallel and not sticking out in angles. So this is nice. And if our, if our cross-link microbilosomes are good, then, then we should get somewhere. Now, just I want to finish just a few more words. Why does the phycobilosome fall apart? And why is there so much of it? Well, there might be one reason. The reason is that cyanobacteria basically can't go to their nearest McDonald's and eat a cheeseburger. They have to sit around and um, uh, they, you know, they, they do photosynthesis. OK, but what happens if the other nutrients aren't around? What happens if you starve them of, let's say, nitrogen or sulfur? Well, what they do is they start taking the phycobilosome apart sequentially from the edges and they take and they, they degrade this and they use this as a secondary source of metabolites and basically they bleach. So if you if you take out the nitrogen and the sulfur, they bleach. This is the kind of the color before, and this is what they look like after. This was discovered by Arthur Grossman uh, in Stanford, and he worked on it a lot. And uh, a postdoc of his, uh, Kevin Schwartz, who's at the Bar Ilan University in Israel, was interested in continuing this work because what, what uh, the Grossman group had found is that there's a single protein which 
works to disassemble the, the complex, and it's a rather small one, the seven kilodalton protein, which they call non-bleaching A protein, NBLA. They couldn't get the protein, it was completely insoluble, so they were actually wanting to do NMR, but then she came to me, um, and she said, can we try? These are, this kind of shows the pathway, there are all kinds of other proteins that come up during degradation, but the only one that actually interacts with the phycobilisome is the NBLA protein. The sequence actually between the NBLAs of different organisms is rather dissimilar, not it, only very low uh, similarity, and they have different ends to them, which is kind of not understandable. Uh, but we said, what the hell, we'll try to do it. Um, and uh, what Raquette was able to add in is that she was able to make mutations, and she was able to make complementations between NBLAs from one organism that actually worked in the other organism, even though the sequence is not very similar. So together with the crystallography, we hope we could say something about how this protein works. This is what the NBLA protein should look like. This is the phycopilosome. So it's really not understandable how such a little hairpin can take this thing apart. Just as she gave us the protein and we got the first crystals because we were able to uh, do something, as I'll, I'll mention in a second, a structure came out by a different group that happens in crystallography often. They saw the structure of this protein from a different organism, and they presented this, this idea that it works kind of like a molecular tweezers from the other side. And going back to architecture, I looked at that and I said, that can't be. There's no way that this can, in a structural manner, make the phycobilisome fall apart. Okay, so we actually crystallized the protein in the presence of urea. I don't know if there are any crystallographers here, but if you have a protein that is sparingly soluble, it might be a nice idea to try to crystallize them in one and two molars uh, urea. Sometimes it works, and you can actually get crystals. The urea doesn't affect the structure. We actually were able to afterwards solve one structure without urea and see that basically, although, although the unit cell is different, the structure is the same. So we get this hairpin structure that dimerizes, same thing that the German uh, group got. And the mutations which inhibit its activity are all over the place. So it looks like you need the entire protein and not just the ends in order to function. And it looks like you need the structure because the structures are very homologous. Because you can actually take the anabena NPLA and stick it into L. Gatus and you still get the activity of the protein. Looking at the structure, what really uh, uh, struck us was that we have this helix turned helix and the phycobilly proteins, well, they're just helix turned helixes. It's made up of a lot of helix turned helixes, and they look very similar to one another, and you can actually find things that are really similar structurally-wise, even though they're not the same sequence-wise. And if we look at our rod hexamers, which we have a structure of, we see that there's a hole. It's a little bit light in here. There's a red NBLA here that actually can fit with the hairpin sticking into the hole, and if you stick it into the hole, what you get is a superposition of the NBLA and these helices, either here or here, because there's symmetry in the rod. And that's all you have to do. All you need to disassemble something is to, if, if it's sloppy already, if it's not really very strongly associated, all it has to do is kind of wedge itself in. I heard somebody call it a molecular wedgie. Um, kind of get in and then replace the interactions between these helices and these helices, and that's enough for the first ring to come off. So we're continuing this work uh, with mutations with other NBLAs. We're also trying to continue with that to see whether or not this molecular disassemblase really works using uh, structural mimicry. And I think this is important for anybody that's involved in, uh, in uh, nanotechnology. Everybody's working on self-assembly, but I think self-disassembly is no less important. So the conclusion are that we can get high resolution details of trimeric rods and alpha-cosinin. We can explain the bathochromic and the redshift in alpha-cosinin and the coupling. We have uh, obtained steps in the complex assembly. Um, we are trying to get a higher level uh, assemblies crystallized and solve the structure, trying to use TEM. Uh, the PBS of a number of, structure of, of organisms have already been crystallized. Hopefully the cross-linking will help us get better crystals. Hopefully ultra-fast spectroscopy will be able to use these uh, uh, new and better phycobilosomes to really look at how energy goes down uh, the, the pathway. The NBLA protein may disassemble the phycobilosome by structural mimicry, but we really need the structure of the PBS. Uh, and of course, I have to thank all those doing the work. This is 
the group at a certain point in time, but who did most of the work is, is Liron David, who is over here, and Ailey, who's now finished her PhD, and is over here, and um, uh, some of the work was also done by Mirav Klatak and Monica Dennis. Funding came from uh, ISF and BSF and a little bit from Techno. And I'd like to thank, of course, Robert for the collaboration. And thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Noah. That's very exciting. Uh, do we have a microphone for? I, I, I'll repeat the questions. OK. Mm -hmm. So on the uh, EPC, you mentioned in your summary the cause of the redshift and the coupling. So you, you mentioned that you, if you put the ionizable charge residues around, you think that enhances the redshift. Is that due to changing the side energy of one of the two pairs, or do you think that's a, a structural aspect? Is it, what's the ultimate okay. origin? Okay, so, so the question is again back to how the redshift of the atom microcyanin occurs. What we claimed was in the structure is that we have charged residues uh, surrounding the hydrophobic pocket. And the question is, what actually is happening here? What we think is actually happening here is, is that we're modifying the electronic structure of these two cofactors. So basically, we get a superposition of, of the uh, excited state of the two, uh, uh, two monomers, even though they're 20 actions apart. So basically, by holding them together and forming this charged surrounding, we're actually making a, a change. We're, we're lowering the gap between them, which is which forms the red gap, the, the red, the, the, the bathochromic shift. Now, actually, a paper just came out from a group by Moran in North Carolina, who unfortunately didn't see our paper because he didn't try to equate it to our structural work. But he came to re relatively similar. Uh, um, ideas looking at the electronic versus the nuclear structure of allophycosinin versus phycosinin. That is, the decay of the two, of the two aspects of, of this coupled system is different in phycosinin and allophycosinin. And I think that this actually uh, can be attributed to the structural uh, facet that I mentioned. And, and I must say, when you look at the structure, I mean, if you look at the function, it has to be in the structure. There's nothing else there. So if it's not that and not solvent, I mean, it's not, it's not magic. It's in the structure, and that's all there is. So I believe that that's, that's the reason. Uh, just a quick follow-up. By, by structure, I meant, is it distance? Or is it, it's, you, I think you said this, but it's, it's not just simply it's, distance. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's certainly not distance, because in phycocyanin, the, you can superimpose them. They look exactly the same. Same distance, same. With, within the error, error of a, of a high-resolution crystal structure, they're exactly the same. And it's the same cofactor. Other questions? Can uh, phycobilisomes that contain phycoerythrin, can the structure of those tell you anything about how these um, linkers may be assembled? And, um, Actually, the phycoerythrin has a gamma subunit, which is the linker, which is situated inside a hexamer. And this was crystallized. Unfortunately, they couldn't see it because of the, the, the threefold rotation. Uh, same, same problem. Again, we have to somehow get an asymmetric structure. The only structure that shows a linker is from an alpha-cosinian from Mastigoclavus laminosus, which was done by the Hoover group back uh, in 2000 and something. It has a small linker, and just as I mentioned, it does not stick out at all. It doesn't, all it does is it, it makes the ring a little bit flatter. That's all it does. He's, they somehow got a crystal structure where the rings are almost perpendicular to one another. So they don't, they don't have that problem of the threefold symmetry. Now, I don't know how the crystal engineer mind to do that, but we're, we're working on it. We actually have a new alpha-cosinian structure, uh, which we do see a little bit of a linker, and it's slightly asymmetric. So this is, but of course, if we get a structure of the entire phycopilazole, it will be necessarily asymmetric, and we should be able to see the linkers there. Mark? So this is tremendous. This is great. All this big structure, and we're going after that. I didn't see the mention of this terminal linker protein that people think is involved in hooking it up in photosystem 2. ABC. Is it there? It, the, uh, I'll repeat the question. The question is what about that the large linker protein uh, in allophycosinin cores that are supposed to link it to the membrane? 
This is called APCE. It actually has a domain which looks like alpha cosinin. It has one cofactor, which is redshifted even further, almost to, six, uh, to 680, very close to chlorophyll. In the crystals, we see it. That is, we see it in the mass spec. We don't see it, of course, we don't have electron density. I don't know where it is. No, but it's in the mass spec, we see it in the gels, we see it. So it's there. It's in our phycobilisms. It's supposed to have, of course, this multi-domain structure which somehow links all the things together. Maybe I'll ask a question. There's uh, been reports of phycobilisomes moving from PS2 to PS1. It's a little hard to understand how that sort of motion can happen given the size of this complex and the sort of crowdedness of it in the membrane. Can you say something about that? Well, the question is about the movement of phycobilisomes on the membrane from photosystem to, to photosystem one. Well, first of all, in the picture I showed in the beginning of the lecture, there's no room for moving, nothing's moving around. That's for sure. And, and certainly there are phycobilisomes near photosystem one because it's just covered with phycobilisomes. Um, there are other organisms which have less phycobilisomes. I've seen, I don't know how, I, I don't think it could move. Personally, I think maybe it could come off and, and, then, and then latch on again to, to a different position. That might happen, but who would hold on to it? I really don't know. I don't think it can move. I don't think so. It's just, it's just too big. And, and Of course, if the APCE actually goes into photosystem 2, as people have thought, because there's a hole there that's big enough for the ends, then certainly it would have to come off first and then. I, but one thing is, though, it almost looks like the phycobilisome is like a spacer. I mean, if anybody, why are the, why are the, the onion type phytocoids in, in normal cyanobacteria have a certain gap? It's almost the size of two phycobilisomes. I mean, that's another question is why is phycobilisome actually so big? It almost looks like it's too big. Well, why have such a big complex, anyways? Unless it's for storage, but maybe it's kind of holding the distance between the phycobilisomes. Uh, I'm interested in the NBLA, uh, the function of this protein. So, uh, under uh, nitrogen and sulfur limited condition, and uh, uh, is there any report that showing the uh, expression of this NBLA is going higher? It, it, yes, there is, but it seems to be transient. Oh, question, I'll repeat the question. The question was about NBLA and its expression under uh, nutrient limiting uh, conditions. <clears throat> there are, uh, uh, it's much easier to look at the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is certainly going up. The amount of the protein apparently goes up, but it's very transient. It's all as if the, when the NBLA goes into the phycobilisome, when it starts to, to do the disassembly, there's some kind of protease that comes along. It's been suggested by a couple of groups that the, one of the clip proteases is actually the one that, that starts cleaving up the phycobilisome. It actually also cleaves the, the NBLA protein. So the, the expression doesn't go very high at any point as far as we know. Um, there have been a few attempts to overexpress it and things like that. These are things that we're also working on. Uh, but, and, and one of the problems is it's hard to work in vitro. We would really like to do, let's say, a biocore type of experiment to try to see if we can do it. But, but the phycobilisomes up to now, we couldn't do it because it's all in high phosphate. And you can't do the association between the NBLA and high phosphate. Maybe with the crosslink, phycobilisomes will able, be able to actually maybe even, even see where it goes and do something to see exactly whether or not our ideas are, are correct. Do you expect a higher uh, binding affinity of NBLA? Oh, I, I should mention just again about the NBLA. It actually happens rather slowly. That is, it doesn't happen all at once. The, it takes days for it to happen. So, I mean, the cells basically, I mean, they don't have to gorge themselves on the phycobilisome. So they don't have to express a lot of the protein all at once. They start taking apart some of the phycobilisomes. They'll live easily for two or three weeks this way until they completely bleach. And if, again, you don't give them, eventually they'll die. But, uh, you know, usually something will come. come you know, some postdoc will remember to add the, 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 the nitrogen and they'll get back. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I want to ask one more question about the OCP. Yes. I don't understand how OCP works. Uh, can, can you enlighten me? Because it seems as though the electronic energy levels are all mismatched in their own direction. I, so, uh, I would, I would, I would, I would repeat. I would say that if I had to guess, and I'm, I'm, I'm rather new to the subject, I would say that it has nothing to do with the carotid at all. 
I think, I think that probably it's a change in conformation in, of the protein that somehow interacts with the phycobilisome, which changes something in the phycobilisome and then quenches, doesn't, doesn't change somehow the energy transfer and has nothing to do with the carotenoids itself. I mean, maybe you could have a low-lying excited state that's not po uh, populated. Derek, uh, maybe you can enlighten us on this. <laughs> That would not be something that you would see in the in the normal absorption spectrum, mm -hmm. but would be the S1 state yeah. that would be of the right energy. I don't know what carotenoid it is. Is it? Is it? I don't. I don't remember either. Okay. <laughs> I may think about it. It makes sense actually. What, you're saying. what makes sense? What you are saying. What I said that there might be a low lying low low state that you don't see in the absorption spectrum like the S1 state that you see in the Friends, I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if anybody has tried to, to I, I, it may have happened, if somebody's tried to express protein, let's say in E. coli, without the carotenoid and, and see whether or not they can do something, whether or not the carotenoid is even involved in it. I don't know if anybody's thinking about that. I have to ask. Yeah. But the structure of that is known. Yes, the structure is known. That's right. Some years ago. That's right. And it but, but that's only of the red, I think it's only of the red state. So it has like two states. It has two states. It has two states. I think that, that's why I think the carotenoid is, is actually more important for changing the, the structure because if it doesn't change its structure, it doesn't bind to the phycobilism. So I think it's more structural. But we get a structure of the There you go. <laughs> Any other questions for no? Well, let's thank you for a very stimulating talk.